Hello and welcome to another episode of Platform in Bevy. In this episode, I'll be showing how I went about making levels that you can save and load in the platform in order to allow people to make custom levels that they can then use and share in the platform. This is probably gonna be the last weekly episode of this series for a while, simply because I feel like the scope has grown a little bit too much in that I have to write a lot of code that I can only show a small fraction of in the video in order to get some of the features working. And I feel like this has moved away from showing off how to do things in Bevy, since a lot of the code is done off screen and you'll never see. Of course, this still helps people that are following along in the GitHub, but I feel like I'm also losing quality of my episodes as I try to uh, rush to get them finished by the week and condensed into a video. To start with, I'm going to fix the issue that I brought up in a previous episode about the fact that a player can just stand still at spawn for a very long time before starting to collect any consumables, and their ghosts will simply mirror this by standing still for a long period of time, allowing people to acquire really large scores by simply not moving long enough to then go collect that many collectibles. The way I got around this is what I call the auto ghost function. This function runs a timer that after the timer elapses, it will spawn a ghost regardless of if the player has got a collectible or not. But it'll only spawn this ghost if no other ghosts have yet spawned. So if you want to quickly rush to collectibles, this won't make any difference. But if you stand still waiting for your ghost trail to accrue a long length, a ghost will spawn and immediately kill you. This is primarily done just with a local timer that is reset every time the ghost trail is cleared in order to make sure that the timer resets when your ghosts are cleared. The rest of the system is fairly simple, running a query to see if there are any ghosts. If there are no ghosts, it will check to see if the player is within eight pixels of zero so that the ghosts won't start spawning if you haven't actually moved from the start point. If the player is within eight pixels of the spawn and the countdown hasn't yet finished, then the ghost trail is cleared and the timer is reset, meaning that as long as you stay within eight pixels of the spawn, the game basically just doesn't start. If the player is greater than eight pixels from the spawn, or the countdown has finished, the countdown timer will tick towards zero, and if the countdown timer finishes, it will send a command to spawn one ghost, which means that the condition will no longer be true that there are no entities, and this code will not run a game. To me, this is a simple and elegant solution to stopping players from being able to cheese the system by standing still for a long period of time, since the ghost will just spawn and follow the player. And it can make the game fun just to see how long you can sort of dodge around and see what tricks you can do to practice getting over the ghost without additional ghosts spawning. They can obviously get a shorter trail if the player picks up collectibles before that timer elapses. But that's more of a choice on the player's behalf then a game design thing I think you have to fix. The next thing I did, and this is more in line with the saving and loading, is I made collectibles into their own type of world object that can be spawned in using the system that I used to spawn blocks previously shown. A collectible object that spawns has two important parameters. The type of collectible it is, which basically just sets the animation at the moment, but could be used in future for having different types of interactions and the spawn type that this collectible uses. Currently, there are six different ways a collectible can spawn and none to indicate that the collectible shouldn't spawn at all. This will become clear when I show you the spawn encode. The first type of spawn is a random range. This, you specify the two corners of a box and the collectible can spawn anywhere within that box. The next is a random point, which takes in a vector of points that that collectible can spawn at. Fixed will always spawn the collectible at the same place. Order will spawn the collectibles in a fixed order down the list until it reaches the end and which point it will spawn back at the start. Then there are ordered deck and random deck variants, which do the same thing, but will remove the spawn point from the list once they spawn it, so the collectible cannot go back there. To spawn the collectible, I first make a copy of itself and then calculate what position it should spawn at. In the case of fixed position and the decrementing spawn types, these will set the next spawn position to none for fixed immediately and for the decrementings when the decrementing list becomes zero. We then extract the animation and spawn the entity, attaching its own data to it as a component. This means that when you collect the collectible, it can simply pass this component 
as the object to spawn in the next iteration, allowing for the lists of entities to automatically increment and decrement the required lists as they go. The next step in making levels savable and loadable was to create a struct that contained all the information needed to spawn a level. In this case, I've also made it an asset so that it can be possible to load multiple levels up and swap between them quickly. Currently, version one of levels simply contains the player's start position in the level and then a list of objects that are to be spawned by the level. Since we're using dynamic boxed objects, we need to implement our own custom serialization format. The start of this is to serialize a struct with two fields, start, which is simply the player's start location, and objects, which gets passed in a custom serializer for serializing the objects. The custom object serializer starts serializing a new map. It will then go through and serialize each object in its list. To serialize each object, I use Bevy Reflex serializable enum in order to allow my trait map object to return a serializable reference to an object. I then pass this to serialize entity using the object type as the key and the object serializable version as the value. The object type is simply a struct that represents the different types of objects that I've created for the world. So far, this consists of the box and the collectible, but in the future it may contain things like moving platforms or enemies. In order to deserialize the map, it gets a little bit more complicated and we need to use a custom visitor. Obviously extracting the player start position is easy enough, we just deserialize an IVEC3. But in order to deserialize the objects back into their dynamic map objects, we need to go through each item in the map and then based on what map object type it was, then create the deserialized version of that object. This all creates a lot of boilerplate that you won't see in this video, but if you go to the GitHub in linked in the description and go to the levels.rs, you can see all of the code required for the deserialization of these objects. Next, I wanted to add base64 encoding for level serialization. The primary reason for doing this is because it reminds me of Flash games where you used to be able to create levels and then export their level code as a long string of characters. This is obviously significantly shorter than sending the full ROM encoded version that the game is currently using. In order to do this, I needed the base64 crate and bin code as my serialization. The first step I do when creating these is to set the first byte to be the current version. This in future allows me to modify the level struct without breaking backwards compatibility to with previously made level. Since if I modify the struct, I can increment the version and make sure I have a level loader that can load all previous level types. In order to serialize the structs to be as short as possible, I use with variant encoding. This is an option that you can enable in Bing code that will try to attempt to minimize file size by checking what the size of the integer is and then selecting the smallest possible representation that it can do. It does this by any number under the size of 251 will be put into a single byte to the top few possible numbers which are reserved to indicate whether it's a 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit or 128-bit number. So if the number was say 255, that would say that it's a 128-bit number and then the 128-bit number was serialized. So when bin code is deserializing the value, if it gets a value of 255 in place of a variant encoding, it now knows that the next 16 bytes that it will decode are 128-bit integer to use. We then simply use base64 to encode the bytes that we got from our bin code and our version number into a string that we return. The reverse is done is from in, the reverse is done in the from base64 version. We decode the string, we then extract the first byte in order to know what version, and then based on what version, we decode it with the appropriate response, stripping away the first byte. In this case, only version 0 works, since I haven't modified the code in any way that needs a new version. And finally, to make these actually usable for people wanting to play the game, I created a game state and added it to my application using the add state method and specifying the initial state that the game should start in. Then I created a make button method, which takes in the required parameters in order to spawn a button in the world. This is just a helper function for the next section, where I create a main menu. For the main menu, I spawn a node of a specified size, 
and then give it children. Using the make button method, I can quickly make a play, a base64 and a custom name button that when clicked will change the game state to the appropriate state. In the play state, the game plays as normal. In base64 mode, the player can enter a base64 string and click play. The game will then load that base64 string if it is valid and spawn the player into that level. The custom name mode will let you enter the name of a level that you have in your levels assets and will load that level in and then spawn the player into that world. The menu plugin that I use in order to create the menu is quite complicated. It has a sequence of system sets that on enter will spawn the specified menu. On update will run any logic that is required to make that menu functional. And on exit will clean up the menu. This basic code is duplicated for the three possible menu states. We've already covered the setup main menu, but there's also a setup level select. This will spawn a blank button as an input text bar, a play button that the player can click in order to start the game, and an error button where any errors will be reported if the player clicks play with an invalid string entered. The cleanup menu function will simply go through finding all entities with menu item attached to them and despawn those items recursively. The state button system is run whenever the main menu is open and will simply check for button clicks on buttons and set the current state to whatever the representative state of that button. The load base 64 level will take in the current string that the player has typed in and if they have clicked the play button decode that into a level and if that is a valid level set the state to play and that level to load. If it is not a valid level it will print the error returned from loading the level into the error text box. There is also the load name level system which works very similar but calls asset server dot load on the corresponding file name and will report an error if the asset server fails to load the file. Otherwise, once the file is finished loading, load the player into that scene. The most important system for these two levels where the user input can be given is the input button. This system will collect the characters that the operating system sends to Bevy in order to log them into the player's input box. This will also check for things such as the enter key being pressed. And if it is, will set the play button to clicked. It also checks for if the player presses control V, in which case it will get all the information from the player's clipboard and then increment through it and insert the appropriate alphanumeric plus slash or equals keys in that clipboard into the end of the string. And finally, at the end, there is also a check for the press of backspace to allow for the removal of keys. Whenever a new letter is added, if the length of the string is now a modulo of 90, a new line character is inserted in order to make the string go onto a new line. We then also update the size of the button and the value of its text to be the correct string whenever it changes. As you can see, this is what our main menu looks like when we get into the game. We can click on play, which will just take us to the level loaded in the background, which is the default level for now. Clicking the play button on the main menu may eventually take you to a level select screen for pre-built levels, or give you the option of selecting an editor. If we instead click the base64 button, we can now enter in our base64 string by typing away, or by pasting one in. This is a test string that I've been using in order to just make sure that the saving and loading works properly. When I click play, you will see that the two objects encoded in that string spawn, and then the player falls out of the world. This is simply because this was just a test level, so hopefully people down in the comments will leave links to their test strings that they create and share. I intend to live stream after making this video of me implementing a level editor of some description. So hopefully you'll be able to find the VOD for that linked in the description of this video. And hopefully next time you'll be able to catch me live if you didn't already catch it this time around. I hope you've enjoyed this video and will like and subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next episode of the Bevy Platformer. I'm not sure when it'll be coming out but hopefully it will cover things like adding the editor. I just don't feel like I should rush these videos as much as I have been since I feel like the video quality suffers quite substantially when I don't have a clear idea of what I am trying to implement.